Sunday at 8.45 on Central. It can only be Agatha Christie's Poirot. Eight years ago, Robert Redford founded the Sundance Institute, where every summer he invites a dozen new filmmakers to work on independent feature films with the help of the industry's top professionals. The South Bank Show talks to... which has already stood for 750 years. Peterborough Cathedral is one of the least known cathedrals in England. Surprising, really, because it was one of the most important of the Benedictine abbeys, a medieval marvel. Welcome to the cathedral. I hope you'll have a very nice visit and you'll find it interesting. We do get so many visitors. They come in the cathedral. They don't expect there to be a service on because they want to look round the building. Reminding me of the day when I had a dear old soul. He says to me, well, don't you think it's a bit of a pity that you've got a service on just when we want to walk round. I said, well, give and take 800 years, there's been a service on here every day. And I said, uh, don't you think it's a bit of a pity that your coach driver just decided to come here at this time when there was a service on? Ah, he said, maybe you're right. Oh, we'll come back. We'll go and have a cup of tea and come back. In the dawn of English history, Peterborough seemed destined never to have a cathedral. This was the third attempt by abbots and monks to establish a religious and political stronghold in this corner of Fenland. Fire destroyed the monks' first two attempts. First, it was the invading Vikings who murdered the abbot and his monks. That was in 870. Then, a hundred years later, Hereward the Wake set his torches to it. And an accidental fire burned the rest down 50 years later. A chronicler of the day, Hugh Candidas, reported that the flames raged for over a week. Almost before the embers were out, building began again. Generations of stonemasons and carpenters took a century to complete it. Inside, the crowning glory, a painted ceiling for the 230-foot-long nave. Only three other examples of such magnificent medieval art exist in the world. Being of monastic origins, it's surprising, really, that it's still around today. When Henry VIII was busy dissolving all the monasteries, somehow Peterborough was left off his shopping list. It could have had something to do with the fact that his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, was buried here. Though some historians don't believe King Henry was that sentimental about his wives. 
More likely, it's thought, the abbot had friends at court, and it was they who persuaded the king to make Peterborough's monastic church into one of his new generation of cathedrals. While Henry VIII was generous towards Peterborough, Cromwell certainly wasn't. His parliamentary soldiers ransacked the place. Everything in sight was smashed. The altar, the organ, candlesticks and paintings. Just one precious book was saved. The 12th century chronicle and register of the old abbey. A minor canon managed to bribe one of Cromwell's soldiers with 10 shillings to let him keep it. He kidded him, it was a Latin Bible. Fortunately, they missed a few pieces of silver plate out in the churches of the diocese. They are now in the cathedral treasury. Many of these items are extremely valuable, and in fact, probably too valuable to be in regular use nowadays. And a lot of them have, in fact, in recent years, been kept in bank vaults, uh, which kept them secure, but also meant that they were invisible. Here is the very oldest piece uh, that we have, uh, which comes from Preston in Rutland, and it's the only piece of pre-Reformation plate in the treasury. Dates from somewhere between 1460 and 1500. It would be produced by a local craftsman, um, and it has on it the hand of God, the Manus Dei, which was a fairly common symbol on pre-Reformation plate. Well, most of the medieval plate uh, was uh, either uh, melted down to be used as, as bullion or uh, there's one very famous incident really connected with this abbey when Richard I, the Lionheart, as you recall, was uh, being held prisoner. Um, there was, a king's ransom was needed in order to uh, uh, rescue him and it was actually an abbot of Peterborough who suggested that the church plate right across the land uh, should be sold in order to raise the money and that was done in 1193. And uh, obviously, for reasons like that, uh, many items of medieval plate uh, are no longer available. It's this sense of history and continuity that fascinates the present bishop. Parts of his palace next door to the cathedral go back 700 years. This is where the last abbot and very first bishop lived. Of course, this place means a lot to me. Because where I lived before, you see, I, I was a bishop in London before, and we lived just by the British Museum, and about 100 yards from Oxford Street. And there was three perpetual lines of traffic outside our door, day and night, all hours. And you got used to it, and we really enjoyed it, you know. I mean, uh, I could indulge my specialty in wine bars, you know. But uh, uh, now we've moved here, the, what I value is all this marvellous space. You see, what the history has done is given us all these little buildings. But it's given us also a lot of space, which is ours. They reckon there were abbots here in the year 640, 650. We're not sure where they lived originally, but from about 900, 1,000 years ago, they lived actually on this site. So I live on the same site as people who have been doing the job for 1,000 years. We have a couple of ghosts, but they're both positive, nice ghosts, one in the garden, one in the house. I don't see ghosts, but the uh, records are there. And to live here with, well, we counted 29 varieties of birds in the garden in our first year here. Uh, and the kestrel, you know, who feeds on our sparrows, are oh, getting on, he says. And last year, the RSPB put in cameras there. And the birds actually got quite used to them very quickly. And there were some wonderful shots you could see in the cathedral of them feeding their young. It was the eighth year they'd nested in a water drain high up in the southwest tower. By mid-May, the fledgling kestrels were three weeks old and giving their young wings a shower in the rain, a rare sight. Within a few more days, they could make their first flight. Next to stir, after the kestrels on this particular day, was the head verger, Bob Bolton, an ex-coal miner. 
after 17 years down the pit, he decided to seek a fuller spiritual life in the church. The average day begins at uh, 6.45. And you open the Norman gates in the precincts, giving the public access to the precincts. It's like opening up the gates to an oasis. And uh, as a head verger, I'm in charge of 200 keys. I mean, it takes 19 keys to open the cathedral to get to the public in the morning. Of the three clergy on duty for this 7.30 matins was the archdeacon, one of the two resident canons, and the dean. I've been dean for seven years now. I came in March 81 from Notting Hill in West London. It was a very surprising uh, development for me. The appointment of Dean is a curious thing, it's a crown appointment. So all that happened was that I had a little envelope dropped through my letterbox which said, um, I have in mind a change of work for you. I will either come to Notting Hill or you can come to the office. Well, since the office was number 10 Downing Street, I couldn't resist going. So I went to see the Prime Minister's appointment secretary. And he said, I was just wondering whether you think about going to Peterborough as dean. So I was fairly shattered by that. And uh, came to uh, see Peterborough Cathedral and had no hesitation that this is something I'd like to do. It's marvelous, the stillness of that building. Um, does do something for me every day. And I think um, that's one of the great privileges of being here. I mean, I know it's cold in the winter, but actually one can live, live through that. I mean, it's, it's not that desperate. It is amazing that some people do have this idea that the clergy only work on Sundays, and yet I find Sunday probably the most relaxing day because um, on Sundays it's very, very rare that we have meetings. And meetings of an administrative nature occupy a good deal of a dean's time because he really can't afford to be inefficient about running a place of this, this importance. It's just one or two things I want to... Um, yeah. bring you up to date on Fine. what have been taking place. Fine. First one refers to the development of Long Causeway, 37 to 39 Long Causeway. Oh, yes. Is that uh, affecting the head verges? Yeah. yeah. Um, we've now reached agreement, I think, with our own architects and uh, the developer's architects about the wall. I suppose because it's a small community, some very trivial things can be built up. I mean, we really can make mountains out of molehills very easily in a place like this. I think we spend weeks seeing whether we could get any consensus about the kind of chair we would have in the cathedral. But I think the consensus took about three years to get on the kind of chair that would be suitable and terribly important to try and keep the perspective right. Not easy always. In the town hall, the dean finds the secular world far less patient with cathedral consensus. I got the usual complaint that the cathedral was far too cold. I mean, November sitting there for uh, an hour and a bit. Now, your predecessor told me that, in fact, it takes four days of the central heating going full blast to raise the temperature by about 10 degrees. But I wonder if we could make a try this year. I'll have a good effort of that, Peter. I'll certainly try and do that. And it's, it's in the appeal anyway, a new heating system. So, you know, in a brave new world, we yes. have a new setup.
Replacing the Victorian Gurney heating machine is just one of a long list of repairs and replacements at present concentrating the mind and prayers of the cathedral's management. For such a great age, the old cathedral's main structure is in amazingly good shape, thanks mainly to past restoration, but wind and weather and air pollution have taken their toll. Plaster is falling from the vaulting, and emergency repairs are needed in the cloisters. Mosaic floors are breaking up, and stone statues are fast corroding out of existence. At the last count, 60 windows needed help. There's a never-ending conservation campaign. The present one spearheaded by the Duke of Gloucester, who fortunately has a good head for heights. Is this stair 750 years old? Yes, it is. Bit? Yes, it is. And we've only a few more stairs to go now before we get to the top. It's a wonderful view, isn't it? Just as well you put these railings in. Yes, there weren't so rails here when I was appointed, but we felt it was so dangerous that we ought to have some. I understand that um, when Cromwell sacked it, left it more or less wrecked. The children used to come and play, and inevitably one or two would topple over the edge. Yes, it, it, it <coughs> is very dangerous. And now we can see some repairs which we're actually doing. And it shows the state of the glass. It's a very typical window indeed. You see the wind howls through the gaps. Is it safe to go up? I will hold the ladder. Now you can see how the canes have, have buckled. The glass itself has broken and the joints admit cold air. And what, what, uh, rotten. Does, what has the lead done? Has it sort of flowed down? Well, it's so old that it's lost its essence, as it were, and become very brittle and crystalline. And so really, you ought to take the whole thing away? The whole thing is being taken away to the glazier's workshops and will be re-leaded, the glass cleaned, and then put back with new bars to support it. And now we come to the remaining medieval glass. Uh, which has all been set in the apse windows. As you know, K Cromwell did a great deal of damage in this building, which is curious because he was a local resident almost. So these were just sort of fragments swept up and left in a pile on the floor? Yes, or probably left in other windows to, in the tracery and that sort of thing, right. brought together. So and all the windows are being put together in a sort of in the, in the apse windows, yes. And you get a bit of this and a bit of yes. that, and very little complete. But it does show the, the, the wonderful colours. Beautiful colour, yes, absolutely I mean, magnificent. For Bob Bolton, cathedral life must go on. His problems are stage managing the cathedral's heavy schedule of services and ceremonies, concerts and confirmations. Testing, testing, one, two, three, four, five. Testing over. From time to time, uh, men have said, when I retire, I'm gonna have a job just like you when they see the Virgin dressed up with his silver rod, that appeals to some men. But what they don't understand, what lies behind that verge. Dealing with the suffering of people who make their way into the cathedral from the city's outside, is all part of a verger's day. But drug addicts and drunks don't all suffer in silent prayer. This one was blaming his condition on Jesus. Bob remembers others. The other day, 
we had an alcoholic at the high altar and he was pouring his heart out to God and then he broke down and cried so I let him cry and then when I thought he cried long enough I put my hand on his head and I asked him his name his name his Christian name was Jim when I said to Jim Jim stand up and look at me man to man which he did do and then I said to him would you like a cup of coffee and something to eat he said I would love that this man I know must have had a decent upbringing because uh, the next day he came back to the cathedral and started to play the piano so he must have had some training and uh, so I said to him, I would like to know your life's history, Jim. But he never spoke. He just kept quiet and went on his way. Just yeah, that's that. quite hard to play, actually. Let's just try that link into the... Um, go from there and let's see what that change of key is like. 